so our, our guest today is Garrett Gunderson. Garrett uh, is the founder and chief wealth architect, which is a great title. Chief wealth architect at Wealth Factory. This is a company, uh, it's a financial services company who has the goal of creating um, economic independence for one million entrepreneurs. Uh, Garrett started his first business at age 15, and by 18, he won the uh, Utah Entrepreneur. Utah's Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, he is also a prolific author. He's written many books. Um, <coughs> one is called Killing Sacred Cows. That's available in the Entrepreneurship Library. Some of you might be aware of that. That counts for credit in this class. Uh, if, you're, if you're behind on credit, that's a good way to get credit. Um, he, uh, and, uh, and I know that some of you are interested in event credit. That counts as, that counts as event credit. Um, Garrett comes from SUU, and you might notice um, our, our former dean there, Carl Templin. Um, Garrett and, uh, and Carl had a, a friendship that goes back a long, a long ways. Um, and Garrett is one of our, um, one of our graduates. Uh, while he was at, uh, at SUU, he was a business senator, business senator, a presidential ambassador, and he was uh, pro, pro counsel for Sigma Chi. He's got uh, an eclectic background and, uh, and interests. He just came from San Diego where he was doing stand-up comedy. So please welcome Gary Gunn. Thanks. Yeah, stand-up comedy last night. I opened for Jamie Kennedy. I don't know if anyone knows who Jamie Kennedy is because you guys are all pretty young. But he, Malibu's most wanted. And he just kept calling me Utah because he didn't think like Utahns could be funny or something. Uh, but it, I have such fond memories of SUU, so it's really good to be here. My wife just texted me. She's like, have a great time because she knew that I was pretty excited and uh, love talking to entrepreneurs. How many people consider themselves an entrepreneur right now? Like already have a business, already doing something. How many people are going to go into business versus work for someone by a show of hands? So most of you. All right. Well. I think it's important because in the news, all we really hear about is corporate America, and corporate America is usually involved in some type of scandal where they've you know, jacked up prices unfairly on something, or they got some political persuasion to be able to accomplish something. But small business employs so many more people than big business. That's why my mission is one million entrepreneurs being liberated financially, because when they do, they're hiring people and it starts to make a real dent influence for people. So today, what I really wanna cover with you is there's three types of mindsets out there in the world. And the first mindset, you will lose every time. The second mindset, only a few people win and it's where most of our false heroes um, exist in the world today. And a lot of entrepreneurs fall in the trap of the second mindset. And I wanna talk about the third mindset, which is awesome because in the third one, it doesn't require money to make money. It doesn't require you to be born of a certain family or in a certain place in order to have a level of success. Your, your merits are really judged upon value creation, and there's a formula within value creation that allows you to profit first and up front and build momentum, and it's something we've been using for generations, but somehow has been lost and forgotten because some people want to make it feel like the only way you can succeed in business is by screwing someone over, but the reality is the only way to succeed in business is to deliver massive value, solve major problems, and actually to be of service. And so I think that there's like a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment in that. Like when I, when I first wanted to invest money, the reason I even wanted to invest was because I'm from Price. Anyone know Price, Utah? I'm not even from Price, I'm from East Carbon. Anyone know East Carbon, Utah? Like I recently went there. I recently went to East Carbon to show my kids where I was from and to get some filming done. First off, the way I was greeted on the way in was just two kids doing this as I drove in. I was like, it feels so warm and fuzzy as I show up here. And, and then like everywhere I went, they were just super, like they were sketched out as to who I was, I think. One, when my hair's down, I look a little bit like Jesus. I think it was confusing for them. <laughs> like, is it happening now? Um, and so that was, you know, that was a little bit crazy. But uh, I, it's such a small town that I was like, hey, is your name Donnie? Because I like knew him from when I was a kid. He's like, yeah, how do you know? I'm like, oh, my dad's Randy Gunderson. And then all of a sudden, I, I was accepted a little bit more as not some stranger. But see, East Carbon, when I, when I lived there at its peak, it had 5,000 people and two cops. Now it has 1,000 people and five cops. That's where dreams go to die, friends. Like, and 
the reason I have so much fondness is because I grew up in that type of a, a world and that type of a mindset, and it was SUU where I first expanded my mind because there's a program called Governor's Honors Academy. Anyone heard of this program? And it takes the top 50 students from Utah that apply or get nominated, and they bring them down to here for 10 days, and you meet like senators and business people and scientists, and like it was pretty phenomenal. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't in the top 50. I was number 52, but fortunately, two people dropped out. So I did get to come go through that experience at that time. And it completely changed my life and expanded my mind. The second thing that happened for me here was, see, I started a business when I was 15 years old. Now, this business was car detailing. And like, just to show, you don't have to be perfect in business. You just have to you know, have progress over perfection and done is better than perfect. The name of my first business was Garrett Gunderson's Car Care. Like, I really thought about it for three seconds, I think, right? And then I started this business, and I had about $600 of net income. And the reason I started the business was because I played sports, which for my dad was really important, and it was important for you know, me to a certain degree, but he didn't want that to be a distraction. Now, fortunately, I had business because I wasn't going anywhere in sports, but I was able to accomplish a lot more in business. Like, I was the only state winner for our high school that year, because Carbon High isn't known for like being prolific at anything really. Um, anyone from Price, by the way, show of hands? Like, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so basically, I, there's a program here called SIFE, Students in Free Enterprise. It was on the campus. And at the same week we were in the state basketball tournament was the same week they were hosting this business competition. So I showed up to the Hayes Hunter Center Conference. I gave a presentation. I took third at that time, which came with $500. So I think that's the day I became a speaker because I spoke for like 20 minutes and got $500. You know how long it took me to make $600 cleaning cars? Like, just simple math here. I was like, okay, this, this. Well, then I win, I get third place in Scythe and the next year I won first. But I then went and sat the bench for a mediocre team in basketball that didn't win state. So like, this was a much better outlet for me. And from there, I ended up coming to school here and just having a great experience like Carl Templin, major influence in my life. I was scared to be an entrepreneur because my great-grandfather left San Giovanni, Italy in 1913. Now, I went to San Giovanni this last summer. It's really close to Sicily, and the reason he left is because the mob was taking his profits from his small business. He would have to leave this place that he lived to go and fish, which was an extended period of time because it's really mountainous before you get to the water, and then he wouldn't see his family, and they would come back and not even have enough a lot of times to really put the type of food to get enough calories to live a decent life. So it was so bad that his wife was pregnant, and he left her and his you know, daughter he didn't even get to meet for seven years to come across the ocean, not speaking English, living off something called honey bread because it wouldn't spoil, even though it's hard as a rock after a while, gets to Ellis Island. They don't even understand him, so they change his last name. He gets on a train and ends up in East Carbon, Utah, because there was coal mining. See, now this is where the first mindset comes from. This first mindset is called scarcity. Scarcity is where you're born of fear, doubt, and worry. You think there's not enough. You try to take as much as you can, and it's a playing not to lose mindset. It's something that my family adopted because of this notion with my great-grandfather. Because think about it, separated from his family, he lived in a tent. And it wasn't seven years until he got to actually see his wife again and meet his daughter for the first time. Uh, he had to save up enough money for a house, and to get them back over. Now, first off, I think his first miracle was getting my great grandma to come over to America because I knew her for, I don't know, like 15 years and she never moved from one spot on the couch. Like she defied every health like piece of information possible because this Italian lady was so stressed about everything at all times that she ate more volume than actual food. Like she just sat there constantly nervous and I think you're supposed to exercise to stay alive a long time. She lived to 103, never leaving from that spot. I think it's because my aunt just waited on her all the time, you know. So I tried having kids. They don't wait on you. It actually lowers your lifespan, just a heads up on that. Um, they're like sleep terrorists for the first, first four years of their life. So think about what happens in that separation. Like bold move for my great-grandfather to provide a better life. But now my family learns this mindset of playing not to lose. And in that mindset... Then my grandfather becomes a coal miner. Then my dad's a coal miner, right? So there's this long history of, hey, if you just work hard, I think it'll work out. But hard work and the wrong philosophy still equals bankruptcy. 
Hard work and the wrong philosophy still equals financial struggle for the rest of your life. Like, money isn't something that we have an option to deal with. It's something that you're absolutely going to deal with in your life, and you either master it or it masters you. And it's a lifestyle thing. So unless you're going to go live out in the mountains with a loincloth and a bow and arrow, money is critical, right? So I'm going to give you a few you know, examples of how to simplify that and really understand it. But we have to identify where do some of these ideas and thought processes and philosophies come from, because if that's how we start to view the world, that's, how the, that's the actions we're going to take. Because our perspective determines our actions. So there's no greater destroyer of wealth than scarcity. No luck, no saving, no discipline, no rate of return, no hard work will compensate for scarcity. It will absolutely make insane decisions. And see, I had this really deep moment of scarcity when all of a sudden I'm going to graduate from college. Because I had started in financial services at 19 years old. So June of 1998, I start in financial services while I'm going to SUU. Which, that sounds impressive, but all I did was basically peddle products to my relatives. You know what I'm saying? I like just have them show up, they buy like life insurance and mutual funds. There wasn't anything magical about it. When I would go to learn from my firm, they didn't really teach me about the markets. They taught me about how to build relationships and how to sell. And that doesn't necessarily equate to a lot of prosperity and wealth. Now, in 98 and 99, they thought I was financial Einstein because they had double E bonds and certificates of deposits. And if you cash that out and put it in the stock market, when the stock market's going up for everyone in 98 and 99, you didn't have to be smart. You just, if your money was there, it was good timing. But then all of a sudden, the year 2000, I went from financial Einstein to family reunions becoming even more awkward. Right? Because now they're losing money. I show up, they're like, okay, what's going on? And this is why my firm would say, they're like, tell them they're in it for the long haul. Who, who wants to be in it for the long haul? It sounds like the worst CrossFit workout ever invented, right? <laughs> like, when does it end? I guess when you die. Or they would say, tell them the market's on sale. You don't want to, like, imagine if you pay for tuition and the next day they're like, oh, by the way, tuition's on sale for half off. No good for you. You already paid your tuition. Right? So I don't ever understand that. The market's on sale if you've already purchased. I didn't like these cliches, these memes, these kind of like excuses. And so when I was going to go out into the uh, financial world, so I, I, my senior year, I was actually traveling somewhere once a month to learn from financial minds. And like one of the things I think you all have is a major advantage. I think all of you, I'm looking around to make sure there's not anyone too old here. But yeah, I think you all have as a major advantage is the younger you are, the more free access you have to amazing people willing to support you. You don't have to write a check for, you just have to have a willingness, a curiosity, and an appreciation. And so I would just go up to people and say, like there was this guy, Vince. This guy, Vince, was known to be one of the most prolific financial minds in New York. And I'd been reading his articles. I had seen him speak at a convention I went to that was an economy, uh, uh, economic symposium. And I was like, I need to get to know him. So I went up to talk to him. But he's a New Yorker, so he just had put his glasses down like where it's barely on the tip of his nose, looked down on me, and I was like, he's like, what are you bothering me for? But then I noticed his wife was at one of the events, so I made friends with her. And his secretary was at another event, so I made friends with her. So I ended up getting to shadow him and watch him go work with people on Wall Street. So he was an advisor to people that own Wall Street firms. So he's like the advisor to the advisors. So I have this major experience where, first of all, he tells me not to talk. Like, he, you know, he was still pretty annoyed that I was doing this, but I, once again, you get resourceful. You don't have to have resources, you have to be resourceful. So I'm watching and he's presenting a $400 million strategy. I'm a senior at SUU at the time from East Carbon. If we gathered all resources of all Carbon County, it's not worth $400 million, right? And I'm watching him present the strategy, and it was such an eye-opening experience because first off, the client that he was talking to owned a Wall Street firm and only had 5% in the stock market. 5% of his entire portfolio, yet he made his money selling this stuff. So I'm like, you know, the whole notion of uh, do what I say, not what I do was kind of going on there. So that's like mind-blowing. By the way, just I'm now friends with Vince. As a matter of fact, we both spoke at an event in Park City last year, and he attended my session and then said, save me a place at lunch. And he used these words, you did a good job, which he might as well said, you are so, like, because for him to even say good, for him to even muster that might have been the best compliment I've ever had from this New Yorker, right? But I would just go and start interviewing and talking to people, the people I met at uh, Governor's Honors Academy, Ren Zafiropoulos, who uh, invented Xerox, like, you know, or like the person in the Hayes Hunter Conference Center is named after. I would just call them up, and because I was young, and I was asking them questions, 
They wanted to pay it forward. They want to pay it forward. Like, I pay it forward. I take a percent of all my revenues. I put it towards Governor's Honors Academy and entrepreneurial competitions that are happening here. Why? Because I look at all the opportunities that was provided for me because of Dean Templin and Joe Baker. Joe Baker's here. Joe is the, f he's, his class was the first class I came back and ever spoke to. It might have been my worst speech of all time. It was like very early on, but he just get, provided me that opportunity. And we also, you know, we talked about Neil Young when it wasn't during class and you know, so we just got, I got to know him, just a great guy. So like, I think that part of what made college a good experience for me was the relationship capital. Not just what you're learning in class, but the people that you can meet and those connections and the insight they'll provide for you because they want to see you succeed. So this first mindset of playing not to lose, let's just, let's just look at playing not to lose for just a minute. Like in sports, what happens when a team gets ahead and they're like, okay, we're going to the prevent. Like I played for Carbon High. We played basketball. We were up 18 times at halftime my sophomore year and we only won three games that season. Why? Because in the second half, we were professional at playing not to lose. Playing not to lose is the place like in finance, playing not to lose is like scrimping and sacrificing and cutting back and elimination. And here's the deal. No one shrinks their way to wealth. You don't get wealthy by elimination you get, or a reduction. You get wealthy through production, through value creation, right? Through growth. And so playing not to lose is when people spend their entire time, like anyone here read the book, The Millionaire Next Door? Well, the good news is you don't have to because I'm gonna summarize it in 30 seconds. If you're willing to live cheaper than anyone else you know, you too can become a broke millionaire and when you die, your heirs will blow all of that money within 16 months. That's like basically, that's the book I first read and I'm like, great, I'm gonna be wealthy because I'm gonna be cheaper than anyone else, but I spent all my time thinking about what I could save, what I could eliminate, what I could cut out, and it's a selfish state which has nothing to do with improving other people's lives. So that's the playing not to lose philosophy. So if you find yourself deeply in scarcity, where it's all about what do you have to lose, not taking action, what are people gonna think, like that mindset is toxic and there's no way to win that game. Even if you end up with a decent amount of money, you'll never enjoy it. You'll never experience it. I have a friend that graduated from SUU. He lives in Vegas. I remember flying to Vegas to visit him, and he picked me up at the airport. And he's making a good six-figure income. And first off, I think when he pulled up, the hubcap like rolled off and hit someone on the curb, right? He actually had an antenna that was just a hanger that was stretched out, right? And it's Vegas. So I get in his car. It doesn't have air conditioning. Now, this was my option leave the window up and sweat because I'm in a sauna, or roll it down and be burned by the blow dryer type 110 degree whatever. And then we got to his house, I'm like, well, at least when we get there, there will be some relief, right? No, he had his temperature on 87 and a half. I was like, bro, if I give you five bucks, could we turn that down a few degrees? <laughs> right? Like that's, there's no winning in that game. There's no quality of life inside of that game. And when I read that book, Millionaire Next Door, that was the path I was headed on. And the reason that I even went there, and here's one of the things I want you to be really careful, if you decide to be an entrepreneur, embrace entrepreneurship, what you're gonna meet is a lot of fascinating people that have a whole lot of pain that they never dealt with. Like entrepreneurs, at some degree, are a type of renegade in society. At some degree, a lot of times they're trying to prove their success through the amount of money that they make because someone said something to them on the playground when they were a kid. How do I know this? Is because when I was in preschool, I made this milk carton project. You got to drink your chocolate milk, and then at the end, you made a little house out of it. I thought it was the most brilliant piece of art that had ever been made by a preschooler at the time. And then Miss Ashcroft said, look, I'm going to take this back. I'm going to put it up on the shelf. And everybody in the class made it. And she said, you memorize your home address, and I'm going to give it back to you. And I couldn't wait to show it to my mom. But I was a little boy, so I went home and screwed around and totally forgot about it. All the girls got their milk cartons back the next day because they're diligent and all that kind of stuff. All the boys forgot. And then the next day, I kind of, it was cold outside, so I didn't do a very good job. I transposed some of the numbers. So now it's the last day of the week, and it's just me and little Johnny, who was like the a-hole of the class. And we're the only two with that. And he gets his address, and now it's just me. The whole class is looking. And I, all I had to remember was 326 Carson. That's it. And I got it wrong. And so she threw it in the trash. And in that moment, I told myself, I'm stupid. Now I'm in preschool. And my entire life became about 
Why did I want to invest from the time I was 15 and start a business? It was because I wanted to prove to people I wasn't stupid and I figured if I became a millionaire, then people wouldn't think I was stupid. The problem is I still thought I was stupid. Got it? So if your motivation comes about proving something, yes, it's a good catalyst for ambition. It's a good thing for moving forward, but it's gonna be a limited life where people don't enjoy their life because they don't choose to love themselves. And so, like you probably didn't expect an entrepreneurship class to talking about like choosing to love yourself, but I think the greatest gift that you can give is to actually create a life that you love. Like really embrace, like what do you want life to be? You guys are holding pencils right now. I love to see this old school technology. That's the kind of stuff I use. I don't feel so old right now. Although my 11 year old at every moment likes to remind me how old I am. I remember being the young person. Then I've been gray since I was in high school, so that wasn't even part of it, but damn it. I mean, he's just, it's ruthless. The, the, if you want to have a lot of wealth, don't have kids. No, um, <laughs> like just the other day, my son says to me, he says, dad, are we rich? I'm like, dude, I have no idea about you. I am, but <laughs> like, that's yet to be determined, bro. <laughs> like we went to, we went to Europe, uh, two years ago and we're getting on the plane and you, you turn left on this plane for the lay down seats. And you turn right for the sit straight up and down seats with no leg room. Well, my kids don't need leg room. So I'm like, okay, guys, you're off to the right. Don't come up here unless it's an emergency. An emergency is you guys are going to die. Anything outside of that, just handle it, right? <laughs> and then my 13-year-old goes, that's so unfair. What's unfair? He's like, it's unfair that you guys get to go on that side and we got to go back here. I'm like, it's unfair even on this plane. <laughs> that's unfair. You shouldn't even be on the plane in the first place. Be gr grateful. When you can write a check, you can write up there. For now, <laughs> just be glad you're under 18. So, okay. But this whole notion of like playing not to lose is an epidemic that I think happens when people come out of school with a big student loan and they start making choices based upon immediate needs instead of long-term thinking. They do it because of pressure from their family, right? So when I'm graduating, I'm scared because my grandfather is my hero. Like my grandfather was the closest thing to an entrepreneur I knew. My grandfather, although a coal miner, had two side businesses. One, as an Italian, you could only imagine this is so cliched, but he played the accordion, right? <laughs> and so they would go and play weddings and all these things on the weekends, and I just thought that was super cool. And then the second thing is he had a TV repair business. You might not ever know about these things, but I know Joe and some of the others do. Zenith TVs. Zenith TVs were like a huge piece of furniture, and he sold them and repaired them. And in his community, he would get like people making homemade tortillas as a thank you. He'd get like community awards as like because he was just doing something. And that was the entrepreneurship side. But there was enough scarcity in my family and playing not to lose that they thought that the only way to be successful was to work hard, get a good education, get a job, get a pension, and here's what I'm here to tell you. Pensions won't exist for you ever. I don't care which company you go to, pensions are a relic. They're outdated, they're antiquated. It's stupid for a company to offer some major pension unless you work for the government that you think's gonna exist 30 years from now. Corporations are not thinking properly. They ran an 8% rate of return on these pensions in order for them to survive, and the numbers show at greater than 1.25%, they won't work. Why? Because when, you, when you're calculating greater than 1.25% and you at the same time have to make payouts, that volatility destroys the actual profitability of those pensions and that's why they didn't last and why so many corporations went under. And I just find it to be a travesty in this world more than anything. One of the major problems we have here in America today is that people are choosing security and safety over value and freedom. People are getting jobs because they get good benefits. Like, you know what, I have a firm, we've hit the Inc. 500. We don't offer pension plans. We don't offer 401ks. We don't offer health insurance other than what the government mandate us to offer. Why? Because I don't want golden handcuffs. Don't come work for us unless you want to be paid based upon production and merit. Our payroll was massive last year because people get paid when they contribute to the bottom line. Not because of time and effort. That's a time when people worked assembly lines. That time of brawn, where the strongest makes the most money, that's over and done, and that's good news. Because now you're paid for your brain. You're paid for thinking, right? Like, I want to reward my kids not because they do chores. I want to reward them because they use their brain. Like, my son downloaded an app on my phone 
that he gets some type of points where he can buy video games for me walking. And I was like, what kind of nonsense is that? I'm so proud of you. Like, it, he's leveraging the hell out of me. I walk way, I walk a bunch, right? Like, look how many times I'm walking back and forth. He's just making points for his games right now. Like, that's the kind of stuff I want to reward. I don't want to go, hey, go do manual labor, and in exchange, I'll give you money, because now he's going to be stuck in a paradigm of, guess what? Robots are going to do that anyway. Like, and here's something, if you haven't written down anything yet, like, here's where the future exists. And people who know how to connect with others, people who know how to create, and people who know how to adapt. Connection, creation, and adaptation is the currency of the future. Because I have no idea what things are going to be like in the future. I just know they're going to be different and at a rapid pace that we've never seen before. If this artificial intelligence actually starts becoming useful, so far it's been very unintelligent in most cases, but as it becomes more and more useful, certain jobs that people are holding on to a relic of the past and hoping that the future will be the same, it's not going to be. Like look at taxi drivers. They're trying to fight because they bought a medallion in New York and it cost them so much money. So they're trying to make it inconvenient on customers in order to keep what they had. Rather than make it where you have an app, you hit a button and someone shows up and you know what's going on, you know what you're being charged and you don't have to use cash anymore. Like it's just simple things. Like everything that you dislike about the inconveniences of life, that's a business opportunity. Like I fly a lot, so it's inconvenient before TSA pre-check, right? Then they found a way to make some extra money doing TSA pre-check. It's even more convenient that I have clear. So now you see whether there's a private organization running it, they dress differently, they're actually, you know, they're trying to recruit because they probably get paid commissions. It's a much better experience. Everything that you dislike is going to be disrupted. And it's being disrupted at a faster pace than ever before. So, like, business has, ha has an unprecedented opportunity right now because the bigger the problem, the bigger the payoff. I think we can agree there's a lot of problems out there. A lot of problems. And it's gonna take innovation, ingenuity, and we already have the solutions within people, but most people never bring the solutions forward because they don't understand money and they don't understand business. If you don't understand those two things, you're at such a major disadvantage to actually getting anything done. So, I think we've harped on playing not to lose plenty. But the, the thing where most people get most stuck is playing to win. Entrepreneurs get stuck in playing to win. Playing to win is I'll outwork everyone. I remember telling my dad one time, I said, Dad, I'm just going to work harder than anyone else's work so in the future I can live a life that no one else can live. And he said, Son, you can never get back the memories or experiences that you never have. Right? So playing to win is where we put a lot of our icons. Like, let's just use Elon Musk. He's in the news all the time. I don't know if you've read about his health or the level of quality of life or enjoyment he has. Like, yeah, he's got billions of dollars and he's sleeping on a floor at Tesla. He's getting two and a half hours maximum sleep. That's going to have a major taxing thing. He get, he's had divorces or at least one divorce. And like, the other thing on Playing to Win, we think it's so amazing that he was living on his friend's couches with zero cash and now he's doing so many great things. Guess what? For every Elon Musk, there's a thousand people that didn't make it. There's a thousand people that their app didn't work or their business didn't work. And it wasn't just because it wasn't a good idea, it's that the timing could have been off. Remember the Concorde? The Concorde could get you to like London in half the time and then it crashed. And so they're like, okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna scale back here, we gotta regroup. And guess when Concorde relaunched? September 10th, 2001. Yeah, so they didn't make it because they didn't know that the next day there was gonna be terrorists that fly their planes into buildings and all of a sudden when flights are grounded, they're at the most fragile time the business had ever been and they didn't have the cash to withstand it. So playing to win is dangerous because here's the question, play to win at what cost? Like what's a win for you? Like don't let society determine what success or winning is. If you let them determine what success or winning is, that's what happened to me in my early 20s. Is success or winning for me meant I was either on covers of a magazine or had all these external accolades or had more money than anyone else I knew. So I either had to go hang out with broke people all the time or I couldn't meet fascinating people because I'd be jealous and frustrated and feel like I was a loser and I wasn't doing enough. So for me, a win is like quality of life at the forefront. Quality of life is, do I always have a trip on the books for something fun I'm looking forward to? Am I doing the things that I want to be doing on a daily basis, which is writing, which is speaking, which is content creation, versus things I don't want to do, which is operations and sales and management, right? So like, I started to find quality of life 
And I said, look, you can have money as a benchmark of success, just not the only benchmark. Have other factors and identify what that win is for you, because if you do, you can move to this third category, where when you've identified your win, you can win first, then play. Let's use examples of win, then play. France gave the United States the Statue of Liberty. What they didn't give us was a concrete platform for this thing to get out of the Hudson River and be upright, right? So the New York magazines did one of the early microfunding campaigns where they basically said, hey, if you want to donate, which the average donation was pennies, not dollars, but they got enough people to donate so they could be the first people to go and see the Statue of Liberty once the guest center was built. So they already won because all the money was there and then they ought to go experience it. Like the old days in business used to be, let's go raise a bunch of money and let's spend all of our time raising this money and then we gotta go deploy that capital and then we hope that it's gonna work out. Like companies like FedEx, where they have this plan and it's super expensive and you know, but times moved slow back then. Now, if you want to go raise money and you haven't built the business, you miss out on huge opportunities. I went to Vietnam 10 years ago. I like to tell, like, I went to Nam, but I'm pretty young, so I didn't really go to Nam. I just went to Vietnam as a tourist. And there was some cool people on the trip. One of the guys on the trip was Matt Mullenweg. I don't know if you know Matt Mullenweg. He's the founder of WordPress. WordPress is fairly used online, right? Just a few sites. At the time, I think he wasn't a billionaire. He's a billionaire now. But see, Matt Mullenweg had an ultimate win then play thing. Ultimate win then play because his people that pay him also became his workforce that he didn't have to pay through open source. There's 56,000 plugins that were created by non-WordPress employees that, could, that people could utilize or that they could benefit from and he didn't have to pay a workforce. That's a pretty win then play, right? And he's getting feedback all along the way. Like when I wrote Killing Sacred Cows, the way I did win then play with that is I pre-sold 22,000 books before it ever hit the market. The way I sold 22,000 books was one, I didn't want to write a book that I'm like, I write it, I think it's good, and then nobody buys it. I've met authors that haven't, like, the, the 90 plus, I think it's like 92% of authors don't sell more than 100 books. But I'm like, that's a really excruciating process. That's like, I mean, this is not exactly what it's like, but the only analogy that comes to mind is gonna make me sound so stupid, but I'm still gonna say it because it's gonna stick in my head. That'd be like being, you know, hey, a woman having to be pregnant, give birth, but not have a baby at the end of it, right? Like, why would you write a book, go through all that pain, and not have anything cute afterwards, you know? <laughs> so, a lot of authors were doing that, or they have more books in their garage than in people's hands. And so I was like, I want to make sure that I'm creating a book that people want to read. And the best way to do that is to get feedback. So I actually went out and I said, look, if you want to get this book I'm writing, I'll give you, and these are, the, uh, let me, I'll explain what they're, they're called DVDs. There are these discs that played inside a thing. It was a long time ago, 10 years ago. But they, they would get a DVD. They'd get this eight-week teleseminar series up front. And then they would wait for nine months before the book came out but they would pre-order the book. And then what I'd do is I'd release chapters to them at a certain time and then they could comment on it. What do they like? What didn't they like? And so I got a ton of feedback, which also meant they started sharing it. So now we hit New York Times already when the book came out because we had so many books already pre-ordered, pre-sold, and then that helped me get more media and it got more people reading the book and all those kind of things. So that was when then play or the first time I did a video series. Rather than just do a video series where I, I had a, an empty, floor on the second floor of this building that I own. I said, well, we should put a TV studio on that second floor. I was like, but I don't want to borrow money or I don't want to come out with my cash for it. So we just sent out a survey to the people that we knew and said, hey, if we were to put out a video program, what would you want to see in it? They gave us feedback. And then what we did is we just had a salesperson call them and say, hey, we're willing to give this to you at half the price if you buy now, because one, you won't get access to all the videos because they're still being filmed. Two, we just want your feedback so we can do better. Like, what is it that you're really looking for? And so we had $150,000 come in before we filmed the first video. That's win then play. Like, we see this in society. The NFL, anyone watch the Super Bowl this year? Anyone else think it was a dreadful, boring game that was like, just, I hated? Like, yeah, it was boring. But guess what? The NFL had already won before the game was played. All tickets were pre-sold. All NFL experiences were sold out. All TV rights were already taken care of. They won the game before it was played. See, in playing not to lose, 
what people do is they just hustle, they hustle, they hustle, they hustle, and then they hope that it works out. And they just throw things against the wall and say, I hope people buy this. In playing to win, then it's even worse. They're like, I'll do whatever it takes. And they sacrifice their entire life. They sacrifice their health. They sacrifice their relationships. And then they have a bunch of money that they just have to spend to doctors and to divorce attorneys and everything else because all they did was throw everything else under the bus. Like, and if you would ask me back in my 20s what my priorities were, I would have lied to you and said it was God, and then it was my family, and then it was business, but really what it was was business, and then it was business, and then way down the line it was my family, so thank God I'm still married. Like my wife, I think she just saw me as a work in progress, and was like, I'll eventually teach him that quality of life is a lot more fun than never sleeping and working all the time. Like, I live in Salt Lake, people are like, what are, your, what are your hobbies? I'm like, business. They're like, do you ski? I'm like, no, I own a business. They're like, what else do you do? business like that's all I knew because and by the way you make less money doing that because there's something called the ceiling of complexity and diminishing marginal productivity ceiling of complexity is you use willpower to earn and eventually that willpower gets you to one level but it's the thing that prevents you from the next level like if you're used to just doing everything on your own and you don't know how to delegate that's going to be limiting if you're doing things that you're incompetent at or merely competent at to save money, it's gonna distract you or derail you from doing the things you're very best at. And this whole diminishing marginal productivity is when you've spent so much time, you're not the best version of who you are because you're exhausted, you're tired, you're less creative, and so everything starts to become less and less productive. The most productive thing I've done in business is I went to Italy for two months and I only worked for five half days while I was there. Like, the Italians just really know how not to work. It's a beautiful thing. Like, one, I'm now addicted to cappuccinos, um, thanks to the Italians. Uh, you know, like siesta, wonderful thing. Uh, four hour meals, I mean, it was just a, it was a pretty incredible experience. But what happened is my business had to grow up because they couldn't rely upon me. And you don't have a business if everyone relies upon you. You have a very taxing job. Like I love when entrepreneurs are like, I wanna be my own boss, I wanna have freedom. Like entrepreneurs have a lot less freedom than most employees because they're so attached to being the person that solves everything and does everything. And most entrepreneurs are the lowest paid labor during a lot of periods of their business. During downturns, usually the only one not getting paid is the owner and everybody else gets paid. We change those rules in how our business operates. Um, or you're the head janitor at times, you're head of customer service, you're head, but every time you solve things and you dive in, you disempower everyone around you. So the most important thing you can do in business is have an amazing, compelling vision. That's the win. Like a real vision. Not a vision like, I could read a hundred companies' mission statements and you wouldn't know what it is, but it's all probably just a uh, hundred banks saying the same thing. Like I walked into, uh, I don't do this very often, but I had to get a notarized thing for an Italian document. So I went to my bank and it said their mission statement was to make my dreams come true. That, that's the stupidest mission statement for a bank, by the way to make your dreams come true. And I said, hey, can you notarize this? They said, well, it's an Italian, we can't notarize it. I said, well, you guys suck at making any dreams come true, just so you know. Um, I mean, we have Google Translate, like are you telling me, like seriously. Um, but most people have something that lives on their wall and not in their heart. Like when you have a mission that actually means something, like when, you know, like the best example I could think of is in 1961, JFK gets on TV, there's only three channels, he's on all three, and people turn it on and he said, we're gonna land a man on the moon and return them home to Earth safely within this decade. First off, NASA didn't know how to do that when he spoke that. He spoke it into existence, it was a vision, and by the way, a vision is something you don't know how to accomplish. If you know how to accomplish, it's a goal. If you don't know how to accomplish, it's a vision. And the magic of a vision is you don't have to be the one that accomplishes it on your own. The vision is something you want to get other people excited about that they can start to contribute. Like Steve Jobs probably wouldn't even know how to operate today's iPhone. One, it sucks. But two, um, you know, like he didn't build anything. He was a creator of vision. His vision was compelling enough to get the tech nerds to build it for him. By the way, vision is compensated infinitely greater than technicians are compensated. Vision becomes the container in which we live. It becomes the possibility in which we create. And I know people like, I heard, I was in Vegas before the Trump Towers went up, and, or the Trump Tower, and I remember Trump was speaking and I was listening, 
Uh, it was live, and he was talking about they were going to build the most magnificent building, and he kept using we, we, and he was saying this. I'm like, he'll never lift a hammer. He'll never, like, operate a crane. None of that. He's just going to create a vision, and I think that because he's so extravagant in what he believes, that things come true like he's president, right? Like, it's just the vision is so out there, and I feel like sometimes the people that accomplish the most are the people that are almost, like, the most insane because there's miracles that happen when you're willing to go to that level. So if you can really think about your vision in a sense of, like, what's the win for you? Like, what really drives you and motivates you? Because if it's just money, you will never deal with the minutia if money's the only motivator. Because the minutia will cripple you. Like, your vision has to be greater than your problems to compel you to move forward. If your problems are greater than your vision, that's bankruptcy. If your vision is greater, you'll be more resourceful. And if you can compel other people, like most of the people that work for us, we have amazing retention. We have guys that have been working for us since 2004, 2005, 2008. Our turnover is ridiculously low, crazy low, because we've created a culture based upon the vision that we've created that's compelling and exciting because what we know is if we help people get economically independent, get their financial house in order, that's just permission for the fun stuff, which is how do they build a legacy that lasts? How do they create a life that they love? How do they change their family's future and financial destiny from being one where you're stuck in playing not to lose, where you're completely abandoning your family because you have to in order to make ends meet, to instead have enough abundance that you can choose to swing for the fences in something that really makes an impact and you're compelled by, because guess what? All the icons that we admire, they never retire. The icons don't go, okay, I finally have enough in the retirement account. They couldn't spend all the money if they tried. They have more than they could ever spend, but they can stay into something because their purpose is compelling enough, it's profound enough, it's powerful enough. That's the win. Win, then play. And then the way that you win is think, how can I get the very people that I engage with that are, that are my biggest fans to be the ones that fund everything that I'm up to because they benefit from it? Not because they take risk on whether the investment or the business works out or not, but they actually receive the value of what I create. And look, one of my favorite business books is Zigzag Principle. Rich Christensen, a major supporter of this university, like he's had teenagers make 590,000 revenue because they had the playbook that you have access to called Zigzag Principle. He says you can start a business with less than $5,000 and end up extraordinarily profitable and he sold 18 businesses with less than $5,000 of startup capital because I taught him something in the most awkward of ways. I had him live on my radio show. And um, he said that he started a business with nothing but $5,000 and sold it for $1.8 million. And I just called him a liar, which is a great way for radio to go. And then I just sat there quiet and it was awkward. He got really red in the face and he's like, no, I'm telling the truth. I said, look, here's, here's the final formula I'm gonna share with you that I think this is where win and play exists and it's how we can understand money at a rudimentary level to give us a profound outcome. It's called the value equation. And it's if you want more financial capital in your life, if you want more money, money is a byproduct. Money is like a receipt at a grocery store. You're not at the grocery store for the receipt, you're there for the goods, you're there for the food, you're there for the drinks, whatever it is that you're buying. The, the money is just evidence of value creation, right? So if you want more money, there's two more precious forms of capital that drive all money. The first one is mental capital. It's what you're in this course for. It's why you're going to college. You want to get access to knowledge that you can, you can uniquely solve people's issues and problems. You can increase your skill set. You have more ingenuity and innovation and possibility. Like, that's what you want. You want mental capital. Now, have you ever heard it's not what you know, it's who you know? You don't, no. You don't know anything, no one's hanging out with you, I'm telling you. You got to bring something to the table, right? Mental capital, and then we just take the second thing, which is relationship capital. People, networks, mentors, organizations, customers, subscribers. Like, relationship capital is where most, most of the unrecognized wealth in this world is stored. And by the way, the bridge between these two is called business. Business is simply taking your mental capital and improving the lives of others, serving them and delivering value. And the more value you create, the more financial capital you have. So if you want more money, it's a value creation game. You're one idea or one relationship away from a new level of prosperity. One idea or one relationship. The wrong ideas will lead you down the wrong path. The wrong people will lead you down the wrong path. So be selective and be really clear. I have three categories. People I'm friends with, people I'm friendly with, and people I'm buddies with. Friends get invited to things, I say yes to their invitations, and I do business with them. 
Friendlies, I say no to everything in a polite way. I never share anything important with them because they're a-holes, right? And then on the third side is buddies. Buddies are my friends from Price. I hang out with them, but I'm not sharing them the secrets of the world because they think I'm insane. And that's totally fine. We'll go fishing, we'll go hunting, and then I'll go back to my other life, right? But mental capital times relationship capital equals your financial capital. Discover your win, make sure the juice is worth the squeeze, create a game worth winning, and use this formula, and you'll have a lot more success. And I'm here to tell you, business has the ability to solve major problems. Don't think about corporate greed, think about small businesses, creating massive jobs, and impacting communities so that we can live better lives. So, thanks for letting me come today. So two observations. One, this is the fewest glances at the clock we've had all year. Number two, first man bun we've had all year. Yeah. So please, one more. <laughs> I'd like to present Garrett with the, with the Cedar Award in recognition of him uh, spending his time and, uh, and, and coming here and uh, talking to you. I know that you charge a lot for consultations. Would you mind sharing with them what this would have cost? Oh, for a speaking engagement, it's 25 grand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for having me.